pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a tag. I think I might have been tagged before and I kind of, I didn't ignore it, but I didn't think I would do this tag. But when I was tagged again more recently by Charlotte of Tired Mama Tries to Read, I decided to give it a try. It's the art movement tag created by Between Lines and Life. I'll put all of those links in the show notes. And I was a little bit reluctant because I'm not really fluent in talking about art or responding to art. I have no idea what most of these words like surrealism and expressionism and impressionism, I don't know what, what any of them mean. So um, I guess I don't need to, to do the tag. So I mean, I'm interested in art, but in a really broken art language kind of way, like I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. I can't talk about it in an intellectual way, but I don't talk about books in an intellectual way either. So there you go. Okay, first question, Baroque. Name an extravagant book character or a character who lives an extravagant life. This one was difficult for me because even if I read books about rich people, their wealth is not something that I pay attention to usually. I don't care about that kind of stuff. It's not what interests me about the characters in the books that I read. Other than, of course, there has to be, there's, you know, somebody who's wealthier and somebody who's poor. But beyond that, I, I, I'm not interested in wealth. You know, I might have a different opinion on it if I won the lottery, but anyway. But the one that I do remember, the where wealth played a pivotal role, and I enjoyed the novel very much. I loved it, actually, was The Nest by Cynthia Dupree Sweeney. And it's about a man who's wait, waiting to inherit a whole bunch of money from his recently deceased father. I think I've remembered that correctly. That's in trust. And he is a Don Juan and an alcoholic and this and that. And he is having sex in his car that he is driving way too fast while he's drunk and high. He's having sex with a woman who is not his wife and has an accident and this woman gets grievously injured. And because of this, his mother has to pretty much liquidate the family trust fund in order to buy off or pay for the uh, injuries, the hospital bills or whatever, and pay for future damages for this woman. And it's the story of what happens to that family. And it's comedic and serious and really, really well done, I hope. We'll have another novel from Dupree Sweeney soon, because that was maybe 2016. Two, Impressionism, a book that left a lasting impression on you. Well, anything that's a five-star read would, but I'm going to choose one that I haven't talked about. I think I've only talked about it the month that I read it, and I just want to bring it back to people's attention because it has really stuck with me, and it's not something that's circulating on booktube or anywhere, and it should be, and it's uh, but maybe published in about 1949 or 1950. Comedy in a Minor Key by Hans Kielsen. Hans Kielsen was Dutch. According to Wikipedia, he was a Jer Jewish German slash Dutch novelist, poet, psychoanalyst, and child psychologist. It was first published in the Netherlands in 1947 and translated after that. But it's not widely read today, and it should be. I thought it was absolutely fascinating and gripping. It's about a Dutch family during the Nazi occupation who take in and hide a Jewish man, and he, they hide him in the spare bedroom during the occupation. It's a very risky thing to do. And then he gets sick and he dies in their house. So what do they do? What do you do with a Jewish corpse when you live in Nazi-occupied Holland? And that's the story. I thought it was absolutely incredible. You should read it. It left an impression on me. Hans Kielsen, Comedy in a Minor Key. Wow! Expressionism. A book with a very personal and specific, possibly unique outlook on the world. Well, there were several contenders, but I just want to take one more chance to rave about Die My Love by Arianna Harwich, which I read during Novellas in November, translated from the Spanish by Sarah Moses and Carolina Orloff. Two translators to watch because it didn't read like it was translated at all. I absolutely loved it. It's about, I guess, a mentally ill... Argentinian woman married to a French guy living in France with 
him, their little boy, and his parents living nearby, I think. And she just is off her rocker, and it's first person, and you never know what's happening only in her mind or what's actually happening in her world, and that is destabilizing and deeply, deeply entertaining. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to laugh, but I couldn't stop myself from laughing, and I loved it. I heard so many reviews of it when it was nominated for Man Booker last year, and thought, ah, oh, it doesn't sound like a Sean book, but oh my god, it was. Definitely a Sean book. I loved it so much, and definitely a unique perspective on the world. S number four, Surrealism. A book that puts a spin on the reality of our living, or a sci-fi book you would recommend. Well, I talked about one sci-fi book in the chat that I did with my cousin Lindsay. I'm not going to regurgitate all that. So instead, I'm going to... This is maybe the fifth time I've talked about this book on BookTube. But damn it, it deserves a lot more attention. It came out in 2016 as well. A Paper Sun by Jason Buckles. And Jason Buckles is an Asian-American novelist. This is his debut. And this is kind of a slipstreamy story that worked as a piece of realistic fiction at the same time because I'm not really into slipstreamy stuff. Well, I like Murakami. Some of Murakami's I like. But this was really unique, the way that it tackled issues of uh, American identity, immigration, through that lens. So... The protagonist, Peregrine, is an uh, elementary school teacher and he's drinking a cup of tea in his classroom while the students are working on their something or other. And suddenly the mist, within the steam, steaming out of his, coming out of his teacup, he sees a Chinese family on a boat in black and white. And he sees them so clearly and he thinks, am I losing my mind? And the vision dissipates within a few moments and he goes home and he... He's a writer, creative writer, uh, fiction writer as well, so he writes a short story about the little boy that he saw in the teacup, and it gets published in some local uh, literary journal, and the next day, there's a knock on his door, and this Asian-American senior citizen is, woman, old lady, is uh, screaming at him, how dare you write a story? A story about my uncle. We've been looking for him for 60 years. Tell me, what do you know about him? Where is he? And that sounds just crazy, and it is, but it for me, it really, really worked. I absolutely love this novel, A Paper Sun by Jason Buckles. A pointillism. Huh? A book where different narratives make the bigger picture. So I have to be honest that I really struggled to think of any book that tries to do this that was a success as far as I was concerned because most most of the time that kind of approach falls very flat for me. For example, I hated Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell. Couldn't finish it. I didn't like From a Low and Quiet Sea by Donald Ryan. It was a three-star read, which for me means it was a bad book. But the more I thought about it, for novellas in November, Lukash of... Totally Pretentious and I buddy read this, A Tomb for Boris Davidovich by Danilo Kish, a series of interlinked short stories that did form a whole, so I would call it a novella. Everybody that's ever written about this book calls it a different thing, a novella, short stories, or whatever. But I thought it really worked the way that he very subtly wove characters in and out of the stories and not only that but the the major themes about living in a totalitarian society and being an informer and being informed upon and all of that stuff it was masterfully done and it was uh, different narratives that did form a really powerful whole so there was that and this book reminded me so much thematically and stylistically or structurally of Anthony Mara's second novel, The Czar of Love and Techno, which is focused on really the, almost the exact same themes and using a, a very similar approach. And so it is also a collection of stories that forms a whole. So there's those two, but I can't think, you know, there must be many others that I'm just not thinking of, but I th think it's the one type of novel that usually fails for me. And these two were uh, big successes. 
Six Pop Art, a book that criticizes consumerism in some way or makes you look critically at different current times. Uh, this one's kind of boring for me. I mean, if I want to find out about consumerism, I'll just watch the news or read the newspaper. I don't really go to fiction for that kind of stuff, but the, the sort of go-to choice for that would be Ali Smith's Autumn, a book that I absolutely loved. I have winter on my shelf, and I haven't gotten to it yet, but this was wonderful, and certainly there's a critique of consumerism, etc. in here, in and amongst all the other delights. Number seven, Dadaism. A weird book, or a book that puts a spin on the novel format. Again, a, nov a novella that I read in November, The Cemetery in Barnes by Gabriel Josipovici. I don't quite know how to talk about this. I'm hoping that I'm going to do a reread of it with Curtis of Curtis Books and Books uh, in 2019 because he enjoyed it too and I would really like to reread it. But it definitely spun some weird and wonderful maneuvers with a narrative point of view in the novel. The narrative kept slipping and I kept feeling myself falling down on my readerly floor, not sure which end was up, the way that he was telling a pretty straightforward story about a, a widower who goes to Paris to process his grief by living a very solitary life and working as a translator, and he eventually gets remarried and comes back to the UK and, and lives in Wales with his, I believe, French wife. but. <laughs> that's a very sounds very straightforward but the way the story is told there's a bunch of weird stuff going on and it's weird at the level of structure and narrative narr narration that I was beguiled I wasn't sure it quite worked that's why I want to reread it but I was beguiled by it so there's that and that's a 2018 novella that you should check out if that sounds interesting uh, the last question, but there are two bonus questions. So the last of the f of the eight questions is performance art, a book that would make a great movie or your favorite play. I don't know if I have a favorite play. Oh, I guess my favorite play is Six Degrees of Separation, but it was my favorite movie is Six Degrees of Separation. I haven't. Uh, I guess that would also be my favorite play. But I'm gonna. I want to talk about a short play that I listened to as an audiobook during Women in Translation Month, called The Unexpected Man by Yasmina Reza. I talked about it in my vlogs that during the readathon, but I want to talk about it again. It's a 90-minute play about a woman. <clears throat> she's an avid reader, and she's reading her favorite writer's latest novel, and she's sitting on the train, and the novelist gets on the train and sits across from her. And it's just interior monologues, what she's thinking and what he's thinking, and they don't start talking until the very end of the play. Don't want to say much more than that. It absolutely gripped me with a quirky, but I thought very effective ending. If you can find it on audio or in any format or have a chance to see it per performed, please check it out. The Unexpected Man by Yasmina Reza. And the bonus question, the first bonus question is to talk about a fiction book that discusses or features art in some way. And I couldn't think of a really interesting answer in terms of what I've read previously. So instead, I'm going to go with one that I want to read sometime. And that is a 20th century British novel, classic, might be pushing it, I'm not sure, called The Horse's Mouth by Joyce Carey, and its protagonist is an artist. That's all I know, and it's a chunkster. I've got it on Scribd. I heard a fascinating episode of the Backlisted podcast about it, which made me move it farther up on my uh, TBR pile. So, yeah, I want to read that. And bonus question number two is, who's your favorite artist? And my favorite artist is Keith Haring. Now, one of the things that really sucks about living in Japan is when you rent an apartment, you are not allowed to put anything on the walls. So I don't have any Keith Haring prints. I f feel naked without them. My apartment in Vancouver had about 30 framed Keith Haring prints and all kinds of memorabilia, I, memorabilia and other stuff. I was just completely obsessed. I'm no longer obsessed, but I still love his art. I have a signed photograph, a signed postcard that I got on eBay for a hundred dollars. It looks like an authentic signature. So, Keith Haring.
All right, that's it. I didn't think to tag anybody, but let me just off the top of my head. If you haven't done this, I'm going to tag people who I haven't tagged in the last few days or this month. So one of them would be Michelle of Challenge Thy Shelf, Mark Nash, Richard Reeds, whining and complaining that nobody's tagging him. So here's your tag, darling. Get with it. Robert of Barter Hordes and Shani Reeds. Oh, and Anna Bailey, Anna Bailey Karras. That's it. Thanks for watching. Thank you.